final point that we want to make with regard to this section of histology is to look at some light micrographs stained with hematoxyl and eosin to give us a clue as to not only the different types of epithelia that are commonly seen in a typical tissue or organ system, but recognize when we see these normal histology slides, we want to be able to recognize a couple things. One is, where is the epithelium from? What organ is it from? Number two, what cell types? more than one are present in the epithelium, and as we alluded to at the beginning of this chapter, where the stem cells are for those epithelial cell types, if known. First one is basically an epithelium that's known as simple cuboidal, highly characteristic of much of the tubules that make up the kidney. This happens to be a view of a collecting duct with a classic cuboidal epithelium and fairly well-recognized cell boundaries that... uh, constitute the lining epithelium. This is an example of a simple columnar epithelium that's highly characteristic of much of the small and large intestine. But unlike the kidney simple cuboidal epithelium that we saw on the previous slide, this epithelium has many different cell types, two of which are illustrated on this particular micrograph, where much of the villus that constitutes or comprises the small intestine, for example, is lined by an absorptive simple columnar epithelium with microvilli or a brush border, and that's shown at the arrow. But at the arrowhead, you can see a couple of examples of unicellular gland-like cells that form the goblet mucus-secreting cells that also characterize this particular epithelium. Now, let's move from a simple columnar to a simple squamous epithelium. Squamous epithelium, simple squamous epithelium is high char- highly characteristic of the endothelial cells that line all blood vessels, but it also forms the parietal layer of the kidney glomerulus, as indicated by the presence of the arrow. At the arrow heads are proximal tubules that again contain a simple cuboidal epithelium that's characterized by numerous microvilli. Then, Let's move from the simple epithelium to a stratified epithelium. But before we get to stratified, we need to to stop part way and talk about a pseudostratified columnar epithelium. This is highly characteristic of much of the respiratory system, including the trachea and the bronchi and, in part, the bronchioles. And it's pseudostratified in the sense that all of the epithelial cells that make up this epithelium lie on the basement membrane basement membrane down at the curved arrow, but only some of these epithelial cells actually reach the luminal surface. So it's not stratified in the true layered sense for that reason. So lying only on the basement membrane and not extending to the luminal surface are basal cells, and they make up the stem cells that are capable of regenerating the other cell types in this pseudostratified epithelium. The two cell types that do reach the luminal surface are goblet cells and the ciliated columnar absorptive epithelial cells. So what you're seeing here, for the most part, in the lightly stained areas, are the columnar epithelial cells, and adjacent to them are a couple of examples of the uh, of the goblet of the goblet cells or the mucus secreting cells, and you can see that the cell surface specializations that characterize this epithelium are dominated by true cilia that are much taller than the brush border formed by the microvilli and the the simple columnar epithelium of the small intestine. Next, what's shown in here is a highly specialized epithelium that basically is found in uh, the uh, urinary system, and this is the transitional epithelium, stratified epithelium, that, that is associated with the bladder. It's transitional because the shape of these cells can change depending on how full the bladder is. So we presume that because of the presence of the rounded pillow-like epithelial cells that are lining immediately adjacent to the luminal surface, that this is an example of a bladder that is empty, whereas the epithelial cells on the luminal surface would tend to be much flatter and more squamate, basically, in a condition from a full bladder. Next is a stratified squamous epithelium. Certainly the best known location of this is the epithelium of the epidermis that makes up an outer lining of skin. So note again 
that stratified squamous epithelium contains more than just keratinocytes, which certainly are its major cell type that are squamous in nature. Note also that stratified squamous epithelium contains melanocytes as well as antigen-presenting cells in the form of longer hand cells. Probably what's illustrated at the arrowhead is a lighter staining melanocyte because they lie directly on the, uh, within the basal layer of this epithelium. Note that this epithelium has not only a prominent basal layer, but it is the basal layers in the, in the basal stratum that make up the stem cells that regenerate all of the other cell types in this epithelium, particularly with regard to the keratinocytes. Finally, let's look, instead of at a stratified squamous epithelium, let's look at a stratified cuboidal epithelium, found in very restricted locations, typically only in the ducts of salivary or even sweat glands. And you can see an illustration here of a number of the, of the stratified cuboidal ducts that are uh, typically found in sweat glands. And then finally, here is a salivary gland. It consists of an epithelium that's a combination of serous cells and mucous cells, and obviously there are different degrees of mucus and serous cells present in either the in the three salivary glands. The parotid gland is a pure serous gland, whereas the submandibular and sublingual glands tend to be mixed glands. I wonder what you're looking at at the tip of the arrow are the lightly stained mucus cells. They typically don't stain well in, in H and E stains. The darkly stained cells that are adjacent are basically the sera cells, and they stain much more prominently with basophilic dyes in this histologic preparation.